Hi everybody! I'm so glad to be back chatting with you again. Today, okay here's the thing, <laughs> I forgot to ask for your questions because I am ridiculous. So about two hours ago I did a panicked post on Instagram, and do you follow me on Instagram? Because you should, because it's fun there, um, asking for your questions and Dear heaven, <laughs> I've got 70 questions in an hour, so you're geniuses, I love you, and I'm going to throw t-shirts at you because I'm giving away t-shirts. This is why you should follow me on Instagram. And also, you should definitely subscribe here. I know, a hard sell, hard sell right at the start. I'm not even kidding around today. It's like, follow me everywhere. Um, but follow me everywhere, guys. Um, because uh, weirdly, we're noticing that loads of you watch the videos and then you don't follow, and I do not know how you know when I've done a video, but I think it's because you follow me someplace else. Anyway, I'd love it if you followed me here too. It would be fun. And I give away things on all my channels. I'm stopping now, I hate myself. Anyway, right now I'm gonna ask questions. I can't believe I'm giving you the heart sell. I'm the worst, why are you here? I would not follow me, don't follow me, I'm awful. Okay, so I've got your questions. I've chosen a bunch of my favorites. I'm gonna go through and um, answer them in a random order and then um, my favorite one's gonna get a t-shirt. That's a really good question because I, like Rachel, would have struggled with the night school exercise regime. <laughs> like, writers write things they can't do. Like, that's my favorite thing. They say, write what you know. And to that I say, and I say it firmly, bollocks. <laughs> write what you can't imagine. And so I write things I'm not great at. But I would have been great at the Rachel side of things. So I would have been like, like I would have still found my place. I've got this theory about school that even if you go to a sporty school and you're not sporty, there will be other people there like you and you find your tribe in that world. And I think at Samaria, maybe I couldn't have fought like people, at least not cleanly, I would fight dirty. Um, but but I would have fit in. Yeah, I think I would have gone. I, and obviously I would have gone the library. I would have gone just for the library. And even if they tried to throw me out because I couldn't fight, I would have found a place to hide. And I would have lived in that library like a hermit pretty happily. So the answer is yes. <laughs> I would have. And that's why. The library. This ties into another question, which is... Are there other schools like Samaria in other countries with night school in those programs? And the answer to both questions is absolutely yes. I, there's no question. I mean, the idea for the books came from basically the Ivy League schools in America, the exclusive boarding schools in Britain. There are exclusive schools in France. I forget what they've called, they've got a fancy name, but the Sorbonne is one of them where like the top students go. And most countries, certainly in Western, Europe and America have these exclusive schools where most of the students are incredibly rich, or at least their families are, and there are, there are scholarship kids, I get it, but let's, let's be frank, like, I got offered a scholarship to an Ivy League school when I was a teenager. I'm, I'll tell you a story. I got offered, <laughs> and I lived in Texas, and the school was in New Hampshire, and I was clever, I was clever, and it was an art school, and I would have loved to have gone. Um, but what I figured out was even with a full scholarship, if they paid for this remarkably expensive school, I couldn't afford to go home and I wouldn't, like how would I get there? There was no stipend for traveling to the school. It would have cost hundreds of dollars and we were broke. We were not a rich family at all. I couldn't afford that. Like, I couldn't come home at Christmas. I couldn't come home at Easter. I would not have seen my family. I was 17. So even with scholarships, these schools remain like impenetrable to kids who don't grow up with money, or at least middle class, which I didn't. So yeah, so this exists. It is still an exclusive province of the very wealthy, and that's what I wanted to look at in night school. So yes, in my mind, as in real life, these schools are, are in every major nation, every western nation at least. And um, they, we, those of us who grew up in, in what I consider to be, and this is nothing against those schools, but those of us who represent the 95% of the population who never darken their doorways, we don't know what goes on there. And so that fired my imagination. Um, so in part because I, I moved to England. So I had my own experience of not being able to go because I couldn't afford it. And, um, and then I moved to England and I live in an area where the most boarding schools are located. Like I am surrounded by boarding schools where I live. And they look, many of them, like castles. 
Like, I mean, they are magical places. There's one I spoke at in Yorkshire, in the north of England, where to get it, to it, you go through this beautiful castle-like gate, and then you drive for more than a mile down their drive, and they have horse pastures for the students' horses, that you pass these beautiful animals on your way to this building, which looks for all the world like a, a fanciful fortress. And the students were marvelous. They were so charming and um, pleasant to talk to and just so delightful. But I could not imagine it. My school was a estate school on a busy road in Houston, Texas. That's where I went to school, across from a muffler shop and a Wendy's burger place. Like, there was no <laughs> fantasy to Stratford High School. Um, and I, in my mind at the time, because it was a new building, it was only seven years old when I was a student there, and it was the biggest school I'd ever been to. Um, it was fantastic. And then I moved to England and thought, ha ha, <laughs> forget about it, that was a prison <laughs> compared to these schools. So all of that is, it, it fired my imagination. I wanted to explore it more. And so yeah, that, there's definitely schools all over the world like this, in real life and in my books. I'm choosing this question for nefarious purposes. Here's the thing. So, number 10 was supposed to be published early 2020 or mid 2020. That was the plan. And then Suzanne Collins announced that she was writing another Hunger Games book. I had the same publishers in many countries as Suzanne Collins, and this blew their publishing schedule because she's such a big deal that it would be tricky to provide marketing and PR for number 10 when they are in this huge juggernaut that is Suzanne Collins. So they decided to push the date back. And you and I will look at each other and go, why can't you publish two books in the same year? I don't understand. <laughs> because I don't understand. I really don't. It was explained to me and I'm like, really? Okay. Because um, I don't get it. But I don't work in publishing, not properly. I, I, I work in a shed. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. So. It's been pushed back to 2021 in most countries. Now, except for France. France, which was always going to publish a little early because they planned to publish at the end of 2019, at the end of this year, was like, we don't care about Susan Collins. <laughs> Who's Susan Collins? <laughs> we are publishing now. So that's why the book comes out in France like now and no place else in the world, as far as I know, until 2021. It's because of Suzanne Collins. So if you want to blame somebody, Suzanne Collins is ruining our life. <laughs> Just kidding. She's great. I can't wait to read her book. <laughs> it's a joke. Don't kill me, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do a video about number 10 soon. So I don't want to answer too many number 10 questions. Like, I'm going to do a Just a Number 10 video where I go into. Um, but I will answer a couple. So... Deciding how much to tell you because I don't want to ruin my next video. <laughs> but um, I would say yes and no. So I'll tell you this much. The first book only has a couple of familiar faces in it. The first book is the one that's the most different. It's almost like a prequel to the rest of that number 10 series. It entirely takes place in number 10 Downing Street and in Westminster in London where all the politics happens. So it takes place in that world. We're not at Samaria. And in fact, the main character has never heard of Samaria um, at the beginning of the book at any rate. But there are night school characters in it nonetheless. And um, you could read it if you'd never read Night School. But if you have read it, you will see familiar names and faces. So I kind of lay the seeds in this first book for what's going to be revealed in later books. So just bear with it. Um, I think you'll, you'll get it when you read it. So yes and no. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I don't want to, I'm not going to give spoilers because I never know how much everybody has read, but those of you who've read the whole series, and that's most of you, know what happens in book two and who dies. And that death was the first death I ever wrote. Um, and I didn't want to write it. I had originally written it so that character was badly injured but survived. And I had my reasons for this because I loved that character and I needed her. She brought so much light to the books and so much joy and I didn't know how to write without her but for the story to work it had to happen like it just had to happen in fact both my editor and my husband who's always my first reader had the same feedback when they read it my first draft and that was like it's not 
she wouldn't have survived this. She shouldn't survive it. You have to be tougher than that. So um, I didn't like it at all, actually. When I wrote the scene where this character died, I cried all the way through it. Like I sat at my desk crying, <laughs> writing this. And when I wrote the scenes after about Ali's reaction to this, her grief, um, that hurt as well. Like that's, it's painful. It's very fascinating writing because when you read a book, there's this catharsis of feeling because you're feeling these emotions that aren't actually happening to you. And so you feel them in a satisfying way at a distance, like it hurts, but it doesn't hurt most of the time. Writing it is slightly different, it, to me anyway, especially with these books. And because um, I felt like I knew those characters. It hurt more, it was, mo it was harder to do. I felt like I was betraying my characters. It was an odd feeling, almost irrational, because obviously they're not real. But it was, it was a difficult thing to do, I, I hated it. And I found it, I then had really hard time writing the third book in the series, getting it started, because I just kept writing everybody being so sad, and that was not something, just like all that sadness. I didn't enjoy writing it, nobody was going to enjoy reading it, and so in the end, the only way to do it, I found, was to jump forward in time so that people were processing and had moved from the disbelief and the pain to anger, because anger is, is a great pleasure to write for me. <laughs> I love writing anger. Most of night school, there's a lot of anger in there and it pleases me. Um, it just moves that plot right along as well. So yeah, it's, it's not easy. I don't like it. I don't do it very often. And I do not enjoy books where people just die and die and die. Like I don't, that's not realistic unless you're in a war zone. And, and so it's not realistic for suburban Britain. It's just not what happens. If, if 25 kids die at a school, I don't care what that school is. The authorities are going to move in and shut it down. If two kids die in two years, you could almost hush that up. You can almost see that if you had enough money and influence and in the world that I'd created. But, you know, when there's like a, like a serial killer book and like 30 people die in 150 pages, I mean, come on. like the federal government would move in. They'd swoop down on the local police department. That's never going to be allowed to happen. Not in this country. So I just, I find it unrealistic. And then I separate myself from the book for emotional protection. And, and then I don't enjoy the book because I'm emotionally separated. And I'm just turning pages. I'm just flipping through it because I want to get to the end. And often, to be perfectly honest, if there's too many deaths, I just put the book down. So I'm never going to do that. So I don't like killing. I do kill, but I kill judiciously. I would say no, when I was little, in part because, like I've talked about my background before, have I? Have I? I'm always talking about it, <laughs> it seems to me, but um, okay, I'll tell you a little about my background. So my parents were not readers, there were no books in our house at all, my mother didn't like them because she didn't like dusting, and if she, there were books on a shelf she felt like she had to dust it and it just bothered her and she did not read so she did not see the point, point. Um, and neither of my brothers read. So the only books I can remember in my house was um, a Birds of America encyclopedia, which I read cover to cover. I knew a lot about birds when I was like eight. Um, and then um, school. So what saved me was Scholastic. Love you, Scholastic. Used to come to schools with like, um, like you get these brochures. I think they still do it. And it's super cheap books. You could choose as many as you wanted. Back in the day, they used to cost under a dollar. And even my parents wouldn't quibble too much, although I'd choose like 20 and then I'd get in trouble and I'd have to narrow it down to like eight. But my God, the day when the books came and I got my stack of books, that joy, I, I'm not sure I've ever experienced anything as joyous as going home with my stack of my own cheap paperbacks and just being, knowing I would get to read them all and nobody would stop me. Unfortunately, <laughs> my mother, who was a lovely person, she just didn't get books. When I was at school, would throw my books away after I'd read them. <laughs> like, like, literally throw them in the trash. <laughs> because dusting. So, did I want to be an author? No, I'm not sure I even knew what an author was, per se, until I was much older. When I was little, I wanted to be a, um, a veterinarian, because I loved animals. I wanted to be a firefighter, because I love fire. I wanted to, you know, I, I, I never wanted to be, I could never knew. Like, what else could I do? I knew I didn't want to do what my parents did, or what my friend's parents did. I wanted something completely different. I mostly wanted to be a princess, I suppose, in some way, and then have wealth and power and the ability to do anything I wanted. Um, I was in college, so university, before 
I thought about writing anything. And even then, I thought that was beyond the... I just kind of didn't think you were allowed if you weren't rich. Isn't that weird? Like, I'm... that's just how I felt. Like, writing was what rich people did. But journalism, which is a kind of writing, I mean, it's, it's writing. It's nonfiction. That, I felt like working class kids weren't allowed to do. So I aspired to that. And it wasn't really until years into that career. And just being a, a crime reporter, which meant I saw a lot of stuff that you don't normally see in your life. And I remember thinking, I should write a book about this sometime. But, and that's probably the first thought. And I may have been 28. So no, I definitely never considered it something. And I don't have huge confidence, or I didn't. I do now, I'm much more confident. Um, but back then, because I lacked confidence in most things, in many things, um, it would never have occurred to me that I had that ability. So if you think writing is not for me, if you think, like I did, that's for other people, that's like something that just happens to you, like lightning strikes, or, or you have to be rich. It's utter nonsense. The fact that I can do that, having grown up in a house with absolutely no books, with a minimal education, with you know, parents who, you know, were lovely people in their own way but did not value in any way um, writing or reading. If I can do that, I genuinely believe anybody can because I had to overcome not only society's prejudices but my own. And um, I don't think there's anything more damaging than believing you can't do something. So the thing I learned from all that is believe that you can. And who knows what will happen. The answer is yes. And here's the thing. As with many children's books, and in fact, this was before Twilight, isn't it? So back in the early 2000s, when you were all babies, um, I had just moved to London and I didn't know anybody. And it was my, or I did, I'd made friends. It was my second Christmas. So, but it was, I'd spent both Christmases since I moved to London, in London, the first one by myself. And the second one, my mother came over to hang out with me. And my boss, who owned the company I worked for, um, and he was loaded. Guys, he was so rich. He had this huge house in Mayfair in this incredibly expensive area of London. And he was going away. They always went skiing at Christmas, him and his kids and his 75th wife. And um, he's lovely, that's mean. <laughs> but I think she kind of was. And anyway, um, so he would get somebody or offer to anybody who worked in the office, and there were like hundreds of us, um, to house sit for him in his giant mansion. And this year nobody could do it. And um, I was going to stay, and I didn't like my flatmate, so I said, I'll do it. And so I spent that Christmas alone in this huge mansion in the most expensive part of the most expensive city in the Western world. And the thing I learned is there are no grocery stores in expensive neighborhoods in London. I was so hungry. Like, <laughs> I had to go basically all the way home, which is like an hour by tube, to grocery shop. I didn't, like, there was nothing. It was so weird. Anyway, the house was amazing. It had like seven living rooms and that is not an exaggeration. There were three on the first floor and at least four on the on the ground floor. It was too much. I was afraid to go to the top floor. I, I never went there once. <laughs> the worst house sitter, but it was just really scary. The house was huge. Anyway, I have fireplaces. So I would sit by the fireplace and my mom was there for like a week and we hung out. And then she went back to Texas and I was alone for the next week and a half that he was away. And um, I wanted to read something, just read and read while I was alone. That was always my plan, because the office was closed. I didn't have to go to work. I didn't have to do anything. And there was nobody to talk to. So I bought the first Harry Potter book. And um, I remember distinctly sitting in front of the fireplace in this giant mansion reading this book all by myself and loving it, just, just disappearing into this book and going out and buying three more because I think it was right before the last one came out. Maybe I can't remember when the last one came out, but it wasn't, the end hadn't happened yet. And um, I just sat there and in a week, I read every published Harry Potter book sitting on a sofa by a fire in a mansion. And I made that week flew by. I had the best time. I loved being alone. I didn't mind the fact that I was in a huge scary mansion in a neighborhood with no grocery stores and that I had to eat my own hair. Like I did not care. It was just amazing. And um, yeah, it was, it, I think in many ways it inspired night school in its own way. Like, I know there's no magic in it, but it's why I originally wrote night school as magic. And probably because of that, in part. Probably because I just wanted to write a school like Hogwarts. And then taking out the magic, and so Hogwarts without the magic. 
in a weird way, that was magical. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. I don't think there would have been a night school if there hadn't been a, a Harry Potter. I think that can be said of many young adult books, actually. I think so many of us were influenced by that series. Thank you all so much for your questions. This was really good and you were so fast. You all deserve prizes. Um, but I'm only gonna give away one t-shirt right now, I think. So the winner is the question that I quite liked the most was, did you always want to be an author? Which, um, just because it took me down a path, down a rabbit hole to, um, to misery land. So thank you. <laughs> so it wasn't that miserable. Cause look how everything ended up. It's fine and we're all hanging out. So the winner is Jane who spells her name J-A-N-N-E, and I don't know how to pronounce it, Jan, Jane, Jane. Well done, you win. I'm gonna send you a t-shirt. Um, and everybody else, keep asking questions because we're gonna do another Q&A um, very soon, and we'll keep all the questions that we love that didn't make it in time for this one, and then I will answer more then in just a few weeks. So thank you so much, it's been amazing. I love it, I love you, I love your questions. I love hanging, I love just this thing we've got going on. And I'm sorry I gave you a hard sell at the beginning. You don't have to just subscribe if you don't want to. I don't mind. It's fine. We're still friends. Thank you for being here. Have an amazing day. See you soon.